All my best material, he got it. Welcome everyone. Uh, I hate to agree with Frank, but he is, he is absolutely right because you remember how I did say some ugly things about King John. I really did. Uh, hurtful, really abusive. But his great-grandson puts him in the shade. If you're trying to do the worst rulers in English history, you're here, okay? <laughs> We're here. And some would say uh, at the one of the worst centuries in history, except for lovers of Chaucer. We'll give them the 14th century. Uh, and there are other aspects of the 14th century that are pleasant, but let's face it, much of the 14th century, when we think about uh, the plague and the Hundred Years' War and so much, that is not good, we take into account that it couldn't be just the doing of one person. It's got to be a lot. But that said, Edward II was entirely incapable of being a great ruler. And what makes it so ironic, of course, is he is in the midst of greatness. Both his father and his son were great rulers, so that is to say Edward I and Edward III. So, as you can understand, it is tragic on many levels. Let's notice some aspects. We begin a population decline that, of course, will grow more and more severe because of the plague. The population decline begins, we think, because the soil was basically so overworked that it finally just gave way. Remember that this is the crudest kind of agriculture imaginable, and the result was that as population had expanded, they had kept trying to develop it to create more and more food for people. And they simply reached their limits without any kind of major changes in agricultural technology by this time. That is thought to be a major reason the population is declining after centuries of population growth. The economic problems of the time, probably stemming in part from a population decline, but otherwise accounted for by the fact that there was increasing regionalism. For example, the decline of the wool trade has to do with the flat fact that the uh, English developed their own uh, wool production centers, and so that business with Flanders was not as significant as it had been, and of course, that throws a lot of people out of work. Um, the famines. We are so unaccustomed to famines in the developed world of our time that it's hard to imagine how very common it was. It's not unusual in the least. However, it appears, at least to those who know about such things, that there were more and more weather conditions that increased the problem of famine in this period uh, due to the particular conditions of the weather at that time, as well as the overused soil. So, um, then of course, the 14th century is always significant because they have lots and lots of bills to pay because of war, and they have precious little to show for it. 
which is always a very, very bad situation for the monarchs. And we think about Edward I, who, of course, is regarded as one of England's greatest kings. Well, by the time he died, he left enormous bills for his successor. In other words, people always tell us to remember that had Edward I lived, he would have had great problems. He left just about the right time to save his reputation. It's one of those things. It would have just gotten worse and worse. It's just people stacking up bills that they're not going to have to pay. And that's the case with Edward I because he spent so much time and money in wars. And those included, of course, his conflicts in Scotland, don't forget Braveheart, uh, in France, major campaigns in Wales, and you can imagine the Welsh are going to rebel every now and then. All of this then is part of the legacy of Edward I to his son. And there he is with his son, giving him his principality of Wales. And see, there your Roman numeral, so you know the year, 1301. And I don't know if he was like uh, Prince Charles in 1971 and had to take Welch 101 to learn how to do the ceremony, maybe not. But whatever the case, as he grew up, Edward I realized that his son um, was going to have some problems, but there he is. He's the eldest son. He will be my successor. I'll have to do the best I can with him. So he gave him, or made him, Prince of Wales in 1301. And physically, they were both, especially for medieval times, very much father and son, tall and attractive men. And tall is highly unusual among medieval people, tall being about six feet. I mean, that was just very, very tall. And so they were tall and striking looking men. In every other respect, they were different. Um, so we won't want, want to let that uh, fool us. It has been said in the Chronicles, and it's been said since, that he was fitted for the life of someone who had lots of hobbies, he liked crafts, if you can imagine. And if you had said to many of the great medieval lords, well, do you enjoy working on crafts? So you got some projects. That's not really part of the life of a nobleman, as far as I'm aware. But apparently he liked that. He liked athletics. Uh, he just, I mean, he didn't necessarily like doing things serious. Um, like administration and not particularly interested in the military. So you say, well then, what's, what's a guy like this doing a king? Well, it's just a matter of birth. And I suspect that Edward I kept thinking, well, he'll grow into it. You know, <laughs> right now he goes to all those uh, projects and he's uh, doing all that basket weaving and all that, but it, it's going to change. He's going to get serious very soon. Uh, uh, but uh, that was not to be. Um, as Prince of Wales, and again, for the purposes of the easier trivia sessions, uh, perhaps you'll get the question, uh, he was the first Prince of Wales, and so you can say, who was Edward II? because indeed he was. But during that period, his father became more and more concerned about him. Oh, yes. Yes, very much so. 
I'm sure they wouldn't, but uh, we're talking English imperialism here. So <laughs> this, is, this is no safe haven for Scots and Welsh. This is uh, England, rule them all. But yes, yes, you're quite right. <laughs> we, we, um, if there are any of you Welsh out there, uh, I'll see you outside. <laughs> and we, we'll, have, we'll duke it out, yeah, because uh, I'm sure uh, the Welsh would, would be very excited about that point. One of the things I think is most interesting after Edward first death when he is crowned, that the phrase that you see in dark letters, uh, or rather, you know, uh, brighter letters, will be what was added to the coronation ceremony. And I think that's so interesting because you don't you just think maybe the great nobles and clergy got together before the coronation and said, Let's make this man promise this because his father gave us the confirmation of the charters back in 1297. So it's high time that he affirmed our rights and we'll just get that into his coronation. And it's interesting that we have this. Every other English king did it afterwards, so this became routine. But the fact is, do you grant to be held and observe the just laws and customs that the community of your realm shall determine? And will you, so far as in you lies, defend and strengthen them to the honor of God? And what I love about that, of course, is basically what the community of the realm says. It's not there, you know, if somebody, some student says to me something about divine right of kings, I said, you go out with your Louis XIV, but don't. That's not part of my crowd. We have restraints on these people. The community of the realm, they are already, at least theoretically and legally, they take oaths, and you know what happens to people who lie with oaths. The big P, perjury. So, <laughs> you are going to hell and do not pass purgatory, right? Just straight on. Um, then there is the so-called she-wolf that Frank uh, mentioned, and we don't forget her. Uh, interesting figure. One of the children, beloved daughter of King Philip IV, he had been engaged to her, oh, I guess he was about six years older, uh, when she was 12. It was all part of a peace agreement between their fathers. There was no intention, of course, that they would then be married. It was just a betrothal. But the idea was um, the marriage goes with the agreement, more or less. And he said, fine. And I think the prospective father-in-law kept on observing him, weaving baskets or whatever he was doing. And, you know, it's kind of like, mm, I'm not sure I want my little she-wolf to be married to him. He's not so great. So it was a problem. Uh, and the fact, finally, they married in 1308, only after Edward I died. So it was very interesting that it went on, uh, the marriage that is, because of Philip IV's reservations about his uh, future son-in-law. That should tell us something right there that there were going to be problems. But I guess, given the closeness of the two families and the fact that the English still held the territories in southwestern France, would have made a breaking of this particular relationship, that is the engagement, very, very difficult in Anglo-French relations. 
But they were married. Some would say they might have been happy at first. Um, they had four children that we know of. Uh, now, it's time to bring in Piers Gaveston. That painting of Piers and Prince Edward, and I don't know if you can see, well, you see four, four feet, so you know. <laughs> Uh, you know that that's more, but they are pretty tight there. And if you look back of them, you see various nobles watching, not with great warmth. Okay? And that has to do, of course, with basically the fact that Edward was a symbol of future power, and Piers Gaveston was his buddy. Don't, aren't they talking about bromances now? Well, I guess they were having a bromance because Piers Gaveston was everywhere that young Edward was, and Edward I didn't like it a bit. Um, he tried to exile him because he was not from England. He was actually from um, Gascony. And at times, Edward I would send him back because I guess he just felt that he distracted him from his work. And um, Edward I was, wanted his son to... Uh, become a great king. So, Piers Gaveston is going to be a problem. As they used to say, Edward I is barely cold before Edward I is back in England. That's how long it took, took him to, because the relationship would continue on. But it was troublesome. At the same time, as Piers Gaveston now occupied a great significance for a week and, frankly, disinterested ruler, those who naturally felt they should have power began to moved towards a man of great interest to me. His name was Thomas of Lancaster, first cousins to the king. His father, Edmund, was the younger brother of King Edward I. I'm not going to bother with the tree. I think you all can, that's, that's fairly obvious. Edmund was his name, and he was Edward's younger brother, and he had Thomas, and then Edward had Edward II. So, I think probably Thomas of Lancaster is observing this situation and saying, I suspect, you know, I'm smart, I'm clever, I do all these great things, but this dodo is king. It's just not right. I could do a much, much better job, whether that's true or not, I will leave to others, but I will note that many look to him as an aggrieved nobleman who felt, well, this king is leaving us out and more or less turning to his friend peers. And of course, peers who is made Earl of Cornwall will strut around and say, look at me, I am Earl of Cornwall. He even participated in the royal coronation, they would say, uh, going before the king and wearing all these lavish outfits. It's like he should have been a little calmer. 
He had the power. He had the influence. Just don't push. Uh, but he did. And they really disliked him. I can't. Everybody around. You know, in other words, if you want to see the king, uh, do you have an appointment? Uh, he's awfully busy this afternoon. Uh, we've got a basket weaving class at two. If you'd like to leave a memo, maybe I can get you in next week. You know, that kind of thing. And you just, and you know, these people had right bad tempers too. They had anger management issues. And I can only imagine how they felt about Piers Gaveston when you stop and think. I think the term we used to use, I don't think they speak of this now, upstart. I guess that's not. But then he's an upstart if he ever was one. Because you say, well, he wasn't a peasant, but he was not of the rank of people like Thomas of Lancaster, because they are the premier of England. And for him to be Earl of Cornwall with all those revenues, all that wealth, and to throw his rank into the faces is only to increase problems for King Edward. So, what are they going to do about it? Well, what they are going to do is more or less the same thing they tried to do to his grandfather, Henry III. We are going to form a committee. We love committees. We are going to form a committee, and we do this not out because we hate you, but because we love you. And we want you to be a successful king. Remember what you promised at the coronation. Remember how you promised to observe faithfully? Yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I don't think, I think he might have been crossing those fingers, you know, <laughs> when he was giving that oath. In any event, this idea of the ordinances, the so-called Lord's ordainer, were supposed to be, as I guess we would say nowadays, a watchdog committee. They were to be with the king. They would approve all major appointments. And for any king, this would be annoying. Um, but I think for this ruler, it would be even more than usually annoying simply because these great nobles were not in any way or shape associated with the king. They loathed him, he loathed them. And he more or less wanted to do what peers wanted to do. And I'm sure there were other members of an entourage. That's, but you get the point. These lords ordainer are not friends of the king. It's not like we're all on the same page here. I don't think so at all. I think basically when the lords ordainer were set up, he and his entourage were already thinking, how can we ignore them? How can we get rid of this? So you're starting with that process in 1311 with some very, very bad signs for the future. Piers, by the Lord's ordainer, was sent away to Ireland. You say, ooh, I don't know if I were a Gascon if I want to go to Ireland. It's particularly if you say, well, you got any friends? Yeah, the King of England. <laughs> I don't think that would go over. Um, the, yeah, exactly. I mean, the Irish and the English have never exactly hit it off, and not that much of Ireland was English ruled at that time. But perhaps at least the area around Dublin. In any event, he got away. Apparently the king had helped him escape, and then the nobles got a hold of them, and we give a hearty farewell to peers. This, as I 
pointed out incalculable loss, I think that is a very fair statement. It may have caused uh, problems for Edward, but it certainly didn't cause any problems for the queen because obviously uh, the queen was not exactly a friend of Peter's. She too uh, found him a nuisance. So there is the king in deepest grief and everybody else is going, wow, this is great. Thank you for eliminating him. So yeah, it's, it's a difficult time for Edward II, and so he does, if he was already somewhat slothful and unguided, he is even more so now, because peers can't even advise him by correspondence, much less in person. Now we come to Scotland from the point of view of England. Uh, now, if you are a Scottish person, this will be one of your great moments. Um, I was on a bus trip with students, uh, and we were going north around Stirling, I guess north of Edinburgh, if you've been up there. And Lord, that bus, he just pulls right on over because... He said, this is it. And I thought, oh, what is this? This is wonderful. This must be great. It's where the Scots beat the English. They are not over it yet. I, you know, you need to let these things go sometime. But they are still so happy. And I said, well, could we talk about some of the other battles that the English won? <laughs> Maybe take another bus. Can I get her? Can I get another refund with an English driver? Yeah, because that is that was the funniest thing to me. But if you ever get this way, they have a big site, and you can get your T-shirts and your postcards. That's the truth for your Scottish Welcome Center. That is the Battle of Bannockburn. He had decided that nothing would do after. Robert the Bruce became king, that Edward II, with not much skill, but with the support of the nobles, decided we must continue the work of your father in conquering Scotland. Because Robert the Bruce had no intention of submitting to England as some Scottish kings had. Well, at this battle, the English forces were defeated, creating, as you can imagine, jubilee for Scots of all generations to come. But at the same time, the Battle, the battle of Bannockburn was a disaster for the English. It's sort of like after all your father did. And now you come along and have this catastrophic loss. So this is one more moment for the great nobles, like his cousin Thomas of Lancaster, to say, you are such a loser. Um, you know, you really don't do a good job in any respect. We can't work with you. You have no military skills and leadership. So this battle is very important. There you go. June of 14, they were doing it up. And you can imagine there were probably lots of Americans who were there doing uh, all the Scottish stuff. So... And you see what a beautiful day it is. I, I mean, not to comment, but uh, this is no Florida, is it? Uh, if you see that sun shining, it's a special day. Uh, but that's part of it. But it is really beautiful there. There at Sterling Castle and the statue of Robert the Bruce. So uh, I thought that was particularly interesting to think about uh, the Scots taking such joy in their moment of triumph. Um, there were others, but uh, 
there weren't that many. It's just, this is a, this is a big one, so cherish it, Scottish people. Now, Thomas of Lancaster, can you see up north the gray areas? Those are the areas under Thomas of Lancaster's rule, and you think, one nobleman has all those lands. Well, you know the size of Lancashire, some of you up north. He was a very powerful man, very powerful. His armies were huge. You're getting to the point of view that ducal armies are sometimes as large as what the king might have. So all of this then is to say that Thomas was a very powerful enemy of Edward II. On the other hand, Thomas, in my opinion, was no Simon de Montfort. He was not an individual who could have maintained any kind of program who could have maintained any kind of systematic rule and authority. And as a result, despite all of his holdings and despite the support he enjoyed among many of the anti-Edward nobles, Thomas would not last. Basically, he had seen what happened with the Battle of Bonnet Barn, he was there. And so he and some of the nobles formed a kind of de facto regime over Edward. Edward no longer has peers to cry to. And for these years, Thomas will have a sort of overseer government. One more reason for Edward to hate him. But that's just the same thing with Henry and Simon de Montfort, that same problem, just different relationships with Simon being brother-in-law and now we have Thomas's cousin, but it's the same idea. Your Majesty, this is what we're going to do and we hope you approve of it. That it's, it's very tense during those years and you can imagine Edward II was no saint so he is thinking, someday you're going to get yours, and I won't be sorry. Um, Thomas eventually, tired of his position, because it is very stressful to lead that group of nobles, all of whom came from different parts of England and probably had their own agendas and they were all giving him troubles. And as I said, I don't think he was nearly as charismatic as uh, Simon de Montfort. In any event, he withdrew and a so-called middle party, meaning I suspect that they were able to get along somewhat with the king, but they were not in any way under his authority. And they ran things for a while. And in 1321, after some years, six, seven years, Thomas came back. I don't know whether Thomas was bored or he just didn't like the direction the government was taking. Whatever it was, it was really bad for him. Because by that time, Edward had a new friend. <laughs> and this friend, of course, uh, worked his way in. His name was Hugh Dispenser. And you see, he's up there, and he was Count of Gloucester. Now, he was not an upstart like Piers Gaveston. But he was, like his father before him, born to be a bureaucrat. And he knew how to worm his way into the king's affection. I think much of it was done under his father's direction, actually. Because 
The father knew all about Edward II, that he was weak-willed, that he needed uh, the in, you know, he needed a strong personality to tell him what to do. And that if he had confidence in you, he would give you all this authority and basically say, all right, you go listen to him scream and fuss, and I'll go do some baskets. You know, that kind of thing. I just don't think he wanted to do any of that. And of course, this individual is all together willing to do this because he has all the characteristics of the dishonest civil servant, and that is he was going to get, while well, the getting was good, as they used to say, meaning, of course, lots of dishonesty, extortion, and all the rest. So, this is Dispenser, and he is going to have lots of power. And his father is right there, too, because he'd been there with Edward first. The difference is the younger Hugh Dispenser basically runs things. Uh, that was never the idea with the father. Edward I would never have tolerated it. It's just a different situation. But the younger one, he has Edward II just where he wants him. So, what's going to happen? Well, we have to say farewell to Thomas of Lancaster. The Battle of Borough Bridge, way up there in Yorkshire, up there near York, and there the forces of Thomas were defeated by royal forces. It was, and you see the depiction of Thomas' demise, because it's not like, well, we're sorry about this, but let's shake hands, let's be friends, we want to welcome you to the family reunion next week. No, it's over and you're dead. Uh, he lived long enough to be executed. You notice they brought out a cast of people to throw snowballs at him. That's just rude. I mean, you know, this is, this is, I mean, you know, you can imagine they orchestrated this. It was in March and it is up north, so... Uh, and uh, he basically was taken out and executed as if he were a commoner. Um, this is supposed to be a depiction of it, so he doesn't have any of the um, aspects of nobility, nothing like that. So I'm sure a dispenser was just loving every minute of it taking down Thomas of Lancaster. And you know, when you think about it, of course, Thomas of Lancaster was of a much higher rank that, than Hugh Dispenser. Doesn't matter <laughs> who's got the sword. You don't. You're a loser. And you're going to be a dead loser very soon. So, Thomas of Lancaster was now dead. But, what kind of death is it going to be? Is it a holy death? Some say yes. I know, I know, this is a big surprise. A cult now would surround the memories of Holy Thomas. You say, well, that's a surprise. Yes, sometimes when we develop these cults, we have to work fast. But I'm thinking that monastic groups in the area now saw the big moment. You know, parts department are going to be collecting and say, wow, uh, this is amazing. He died so that we humans could be free and happy. And now we've had, he has his own prayers. Pretty good. To get your own set of prayers, you've got to be special. So let's see how this one goes. Oh, he's beheaded for the aid of the commons. Surprise. Uh, we didn't know that. Uh, 
could it be that somebody thought this up? I, I don't know. Thomas would have been really surprised. I don't know if they had said, did you know you died on behalf of all the poor folks? He was said, shut up. Are you kidding me? Thank you very much. What an honor. You know, they, he would have been really surprised because believe me, he was not out there working with the community chest. I can promise you. This guy was an arrogant uh, nobleman, totally. But anyway, strenuous champion of plentiful charity who did combat for the law of England's liberty, intercede for our sins with the Father of glory. So, this little movement of Thomas people, Thomasites, and you know, they would say, I mean, you know, and then people say, would you like to see some parts of Thomas or all of that? <laughs> they say, just, just an offering, you know, and we could get you in. Uh, yeah, next seating, uh, next view, next tour, a couple of hours, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, you can, don't go home, though, and check and see if there are any St. Thomas of Lancaster churches. I think it passed. But it... In its day, it had uh, great interest. I, I just find that rather curious how when these people die, because by this point, and certainly afterwards, Edward II is going to have such a terrible reputation that when uh, Thomas dies, people are going to say, wow. So that's what his death was all about, to save us. Thank you, Thomas. You know, that kind of thing. That's why I say if he had come back, he would have been really surprised. Uh, and I don't know if he would have appreciated it either. So, um, in any event, now Dispenser is in. And he is in because the king thinks Dispenser is the greatest thing going. That's just as simple as it can be, as simple as I can put it that Edward II allows Dispenser unlimited control over the government. Thomas and many nobles who had supported him died in the Battle of Borough Bridge or executed afterwards. And it is said that during these years, five years, that this element around the king and Dispenser were able to do whatever they wished. And that, of course, does involve a lot of extortion, a lot of misappropriation of government funds, um, because Hugh Dispenser had carte blanche. I am in no way excusing uh, the king when I say that, but I do feel like it was not a co-equal partnership. The king is merely the nominal ruler and dispenser is running the government. And I know, I know you're thinking, but where is the she-wolf? Well, she's going to be a very important consideration. Now, Scotland is no longer a major issue, but France is. Remember, she was the daughter of a king of France, now deceased, and she was the sister of those who followed. Anglo-French problems, as I promised you, have continued to uh, uh, go on, and they will as long as the English are in France. The question is, how is this going to affect the future of Edward II? And not to mention, as I used to say in one of the uh, women's magazines when I was a boy, can this marriage be saved? Yeah, if some of you remember Ladies Home Journal, I think. Uh, so we will pick it up there in five minutes. Five minutes. 
only. Let's go back to getting this business of Gasconing. Normally, it's not important in the sense that England and France periodically have their little tiffs over those southern territories, in part, I think, due to the fact that the French, I don't feel, were ever willing to fully acquiesce in the English possession of French territory. But they had to for the reason that they could not prevent it, although they could, shall we say, make the amount of territory smaller and smaller as time went on. In any event, there was a, a brief tete-a-tete between the English and French in 1324. And Isabella's brother, who was now king of France, would pronounce the uh, fief confiscated and pronounce Edward a contumacious vassal. Uh, you know, again, these, this is standard procedure. French troops would go in. And so the question was... I think, to a great extent, well, what are they going to do about it now? And that's the crux of the issue. I'm not sure if, and this will sound strange, Edward II was altogether free to do as he wanted. That's how strong, I think, the power of Hugh Dispenser was. I'm not sure if it's a power of physical force so much as it's emotional. But whatever it was, I don't think Edward II could have just picked up and said, you know, I've got to go to France and get this business straightened out. As a result, in comes Isabella. As I told you earlier, she was the wife of Edward II due to a previous agreement between their fathers. She'd had four children by him, but when the evidence that she had little influence with him and that the influence ranged at first with Piers Gaveston, and then on with Dispenser, it was said that she became his bitter enemy. It's odd, really, that no one ever said anything about ending the marriage. It was just, um, they just despised each other. Uh, however, she was still the sister of the king of France. So, whether she thought all this up or whether she did it in collaboration with others who disliked her husband, of whom there were lots, she finally persuaded King Edward, or Hugh, more likely, to let her go to France. That was her ticket out. They didn't know that. When she was granted permission to go to Paris to settle the differences between her husband and her brother. And she was basically like, I'm out of here. <laughs> However, not with her children. Yes. So that is an issue. So for a time, once she gets to Paris, and we actually have these letters, they are all very pleasant, very nice, having a great time, wish you were here, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, Paris is so pretty this time of year. You know, all of that. So you never have that sense uh, what 
you're going to get yours, you loser. God, I hate you. You know, all of that. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, it's sort of like when you read these, you know how it's going to come out, but she wouldn't have dared do that as long as he had the children. So, what in fact will happen is that she will go to Paris to negotiate with her brother, King Charles, who's known as Charles the Fair, Charles the Fourth, and she will represent her husband, and she will send back to her husband, Edward II, and says, Dearest, uh, could Eddie come over I know how busy you are with all your kingly duties. And I would not want you to be distracted. But just a little time, I need a little Edward to come over because we need to have him for a ceremony between him and Charlie. Uh, it's one of these Lord and Vassal ceremonies because... The relationship has been renegotiated. Very clever. How Hugh, not Edward, I, I mean, I, you have no respect for him, but Hugh fell for it, and he sent young Edward over there with an entourage, and he would go to represent his father. And then there would be a ceremony. Sort of like letting younger Edward, the future Edward III, give fealty and homage to his uncle as a proxy for his father. Now, if you get that point, you might just think, well, that was done, then we'll catch the next boat headed across the channel. Oh, no, we won't. <laughs> oh, yeah, those letters changed tone. Believe you me, I think he finally woke up to the fact that he had uh, lost control of his wife and he could not get his son back. The son being, oh, 12, 13 maybe, at that particular time. Incidentally, no one has ever determined exactly why Edward stayed with his mother or whether or not he had any say. He is sort of like um, a captive of his mother. But whatever the case, it was not that his father didn't order him back. He did. But they are there in Paris that is the queen, a.k.a. She-Wolf, along with her son, and they are in big trouble. This, by the way, is an interesting illustration of the queen being received by her brother, uh, and you could probably see the fleur-de-lis on his horse. Well, there is a plot. But as always, there's a love, but not a good one. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, you might say you really need to uh, lay off the queen. I mean, she'd had a rough time. And now she's going to meet up at Charles Court. Perhaps they already knew each other. His name was Roger Mortimer, a prominent nobleman. He was an ally of Thomas of Lancaster, remember him? Battle of Borough Bridge. He had escaped. He was one of the lucky ones who uh, was able to get to France. I mean, he had lost a lot of prestige and territories. He was persona non grata, I would think, at the court of Edward II. But he got to France, and somehow 
he and the queen became more than friends. You say, but it's so wrong, and yet it was so right. They, <laughs> yes, yes, it was, oh, how do you spell torrid? Yes, many of the books describe this as quite the, uh, quite the pair. The Queen with Roger Mortimer. You say, well, I mean, he was just a free. No, he wasn't. He was married. But again, irrelevant. They were involved in this together. And we don't know when they reached the point that Edward II had to go. It's like maybe after they decided they were had this special relationship, and that the husband was more than a nuisance, particularly because he was king of England. As their relationship became more obvious, some say that her brother encouraged her to move on, I think he was concerned not necessarily about her moral Dance, but I think if an issue of Anglo-French relations comes up, this would hardly be uh, a good matter that I am countenancing this at my court, whatever the um, case. They now become co-conspirators and presumably make their decision, as far as Edward is concerned, to fish or um, cut bait. It's, he's got to go. He's a loser and I hate him. And there's no going back and saying, honey, I'm home. All those stories you heard, oh, he meant nothing. He's so unlike you, you're, just, you're, you're my prince. Yeah. No, <laughs> there's no going back. Uh, so, what must Edward II and Hugh Dispenser have been thinking at that point? They must have been thinking, wow, have we got a mess. But what are they going to do about it? They have been, uh, Hugh and his crowd have been systematically plundering the uh, well-to-do of England for some time. Their allies are few, and one gets the sense that maybe Rog, Roger was in contact with lots of unhappy people back home. Sort of, remember Borough Bridge? We're coming back, and we're going to make you glad we did come back. So, at this point then... Isabella is going to go north to a part of Flanders, modern-day Belgium, to talk to the Count of uh, Anoy, Philippa had been the intended of the young Edward, but Isabella decides to uh, proceed with the plans. Again, I don't know if she comes in and says, you know, we were kind of on the way home, and uh, have you met Roger? He's my special friend. Uh, I think, you know, this is all very delicate, right? Uh, but uh, somehow, this relationship between daughter and son had already been negotiated, and what she wants is an advance on that dowry. You think, oh, the filth of lucre, yes. As fast as she can get it, because she's got plans to use it. So, that relationship, the plans for that marriage, between Isabella's son 
and the count's daughter are negotiating. Now, Philip is not going with them. So they've got, it's not time for the wedding by any means. We've got some other things we've got to do, some ugly things we have to do first. We'll, we'll call you when we're ready. But we'll just, we'll just take that little advance uh, and we wish you all a good day. So, that's how that happened and off Isabella goes with Roger and her son. Now, there's, there we are when you see Hannah right over there from Flanders. See over there. So that area, in that area, that's where she came from and would go on to be a very great uh, Queen of England. Philippa, the wife of Edward III, very highly regarded. So, when you think about significance, strategic significance of where her family was from, and then you think about the future of relations between England and France, all of this seems even more important. But right now, I just want to focus on Isabella going up there with her friend, special friend, and her son, and getting part of this money. I think that's, as the British would say, pretty cheeky. Uh, but they are setting up their final plans for an invasion. And as I say, what do you think Dispenser and Edward II are thinking? Uh, you know, we, we better get ready. But there was a coup. They arrive. They have supporters waiting for them. They brought forces with them. Dowries can often be very useful. And the end of Edward II's government is at hand. It is a coup d'etat, and that's what I called it, because they literally take over the government. And it is nasty. There is dispen dispenser up there on the ladder. Mm hmm And that's not, yeah, that's not good. That's a... Uh, <laughs> I can, you can just imagine they're not doing this for a lab experiment, okay? So this is definitely not, no. Uh, oh, what nice parts he has. No. Uh, they want to make this as unpleasant and horrible as they can, and I think they did a very good job on Hugh Dispenser. So that was the end of him. The king, well, that's another very interesting story. And it takes us to a place near Gloucester, England, called Barclay Castle. Have any of you been up there to Barclay? Oh, you've been up there. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, they still use it now for weddings and events. It's... It is just absolutely beautiful. And it's a shame whenever I think of Barclay Castle, I think of Edward II, because that's not a happy time in Edward II's life. <laughs> but here it is. Um, and they will tell you about it in the tour. They try to make it a sort of G-rated. I mean, they don't want to get into too much of the unpleasantries. But believe you me, Mortimer's agents who maintained Edward II, shall we say, under custody, was not running room service or was not saying, can we get you anything? You are such a special guest. No. Uh, this, was, this was pretty bad. This was pretty bad. The treatment of the almost ex-king. What they must have done to him to abdicate is unbelievable. Why it happened, how it happened, but it happened. 
There's no doubt about that. They, they extracted from him an abdication, more or less saying, I have failed, I am miserable, I am no longer worthy to be king. Uh, now, the queen and Mortimer were nowhere to be seen. They were busy with uh, their governmental responsibilities. This was all handled by special agents who were there at Gloucester. Was he murdered? Well, some have said he was. Once they had the abdication, we really don't need him anymore. He's just taking up space. So, where do we go to find out? Well, let's go to Marlowe. For literature fans, Marlowe's play, and you'll notice that the troublesome reign and lamentable death of Edward II, the original edition at the end of the 16th century, when he tells the story of the horrible execution and the screams of Edward II in the night as the poker was administered so that no vestiges of injury to the body would be seen. That is the Marlowe version. However, All we know about it historically is that some chronicles tell that story and tell about the fact that there would be a great funeral given there at Gloucester Cathedral. Of course, the monks of Gloucester Cathedral were thrilled to have him. Because you can imagine, we've got a king, we've got a king. You know, that's... He may be an ex-king, but shoot, that counts. So, I mean, you know, when you think about your revenues, um, uh, kings are good. Uh, and dead ones are, are fine. I mean, that's not a problem. Ex-dead kings. So, they have him, the queen attends. She acted properly mournful and all the rest. Having her little boy with her, I'm sure it was very sweet. But there was something that seemed very strange about the whole business. Now, if you ever get up that way and see the uh, cathedral, it's Gloucester Cathedral. It's near Barclay Castle, actually. Uh, he was buried there. It's very beautiful. And so what? Well, the so what of this story is that some people doubt that he actually died. Yes. Let me say, my professor at Emory called me. He said, you must come to dinner. I said, what have I, you know, it's sort of like, oh God, what have I done? Uh, you know, and he said, I'm coming up with a new theory. I said, oh, sir, I'm just delighted. You know, of course, what am I going to say, worm? Uh, I said, he said, I don't believe Edward II is buried at Gloucester Cathedral. Mm -hmm. He had been doing research in northern Italy, and with other correspondence to Edward III, which led him to believe that someone else was buried in that place. That in fact, Edward II, according to a papal official in a letter to Edward III, that he had overpowered his guard and the former king had escaped to northern Italy where he lived a kind of semi-solitary life. What my professor needed to do 
was to get permission from the officials of Gloucester Cathedral to measure the body. And he didn't get it. <laughs> so, I guess we will never know. He was sure that if he could get into that tomb and find out that that was some short fella, he was going to get some... This would bust the medieval world. You know, can imagine at the Medieval Academy Convention, they would just go crazy. Oh, my God. Awards, celebrations. But we all have to leave this as a possibility because the other way, the idea of the death of Edward II by murder is merely a theory based on the words of a playwright which was based on a chronicle. In other words, there is no specific physical evidence to prove it. But, whatever the case, he's out of the picture. And Edward II is now king. Well, nominal king. Because mother and uncle Roger, I think, are still in charge. From 1327 to 1330, that is the situation. And when we think Hugh Dispenser had extorted and stole, I'm not sure that Roger Mortimer was a whole lot better in that regard. And I think she, though she was queen, she does not seem to have done much to control him. Now, there was no question, in case you're wondering, of them running off and having a quickie marriage or anything like that. I don't think queens marry beneath them. They may have romps with them, but they don't have marriages with them. So, they maintain the polite fiction. This is just a special friend that I like to visit. And uh, he, ha he gives me advice sometimes. And then, so... It just goes on, and of course, you know what happened. We all watch it happen. Little boys become big boys. Yes, exactly. And little Eddie is just growing up every day and saying, Oh, Mommy, Mommy, you and Uncle Roger, you, uh, the way you look after the government, it's really efficient. But not for much longer. Apparently, one day in 1330, he has, he's of late teens, maybe, and you know, you always wonder what were Mortimer and Isabella thinking. Maybe they just had breakfast or something like that. And in he walks with a guard. Yeah. Takes Uncle Roger away because he's leaving, leaving this world. And uh, the queen is going away. She's going into retirement. Okay. <laughs> no more love nests for her. Going to be a lot of needlework, <laughs> crocheting, tatting. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think this will be an all-female environment. So uh, that's the end of Isabella as far as the political. But you know, he and his mother were very close. She lived until 1358. Yeah, he would go and visit her if they'd had Mother's Day back then. I bet he would have written her the sweet notes. I think they just didn't bring up Uncle Roger anymore. I think he was just a non-subject because Roger was out of there. Okay, so he blamed, I guess he thought of Roger as being a usurper because he was ready to be king himself. And king he became. One of the great kings, King Edward III. So Mortimer and Isabella play an interesting and significant role in English history. There's no doubt about it. How they were able to pull this off and then maintain control of the government for three years is an amazing story to me. And it shows, I think, the levels to which Edward II had sunk 
that they could in his unpopularity simply take power away. Whether or not the nobility were altogether satisfied with it is another story. But for this period, there is a kind of vacuum in going on. Now the son, Edward III, is with a 50-year reign going to be one of England's most important rulers. It is in his time that Parliament will become two houses and will evolve into a major organ of government that it still remains. It will be under him that the Hundred Years' War will begin. It will be under him that the first waves of the Black Death will occur. So much, in other words, is going to go on in this period, and he will be, at least in the early decades, a very popular ruler. I think they call people like this dashing. Um, a man's man. He was quite devoted to the cult of chivalry, loved all the knightly activities, that he is knightly with a K, uh, more or less the sorts of activities that his father cared nothing about. Remember, his father's doing that weaving. So, and you say, well, where is his basket collection? Doesn't have it. I mean, you know, it's very interesting. It's just like, where did Edward II come from? It's just like, he's so different from his father, so different from his son, but that is the way that it is. Now, again, to remind you, he was a boy king, and he lived, I just can't imagine now if they'd had a psychologist and to ask him questions, well, how did you feel about your mother and her special friend? I mean, was that, was that difficult for you? <laughs> I mean, those are questions that history can't answer for us. But we assume he grew up in a rather strange environment, not the least of which is wondering, I wonder what happened to Dad, you know? <laughs> uh, but all of this is to say that as a late teen, he was ready to take power for himself with his queen, Philippa, to launch into a reign of great momentum for the future of late medieval England. And there we will start on next week. Okay? Thank you.